Well, Karen, thank you so much. Thank you to SSATB for this opportunity to present today. Uh, the title of this is The Communication Flow, Increasing Enrollment Through Strategic Conversations. So first let me introduce myself a little bit here. Uh, again, my name is Jeff. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Front Range Christian School in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, my background, I actually did my Master of Divinity at Denver Seminary, and I worked in higher education for uh, a year at Denver Seminary, as well as a pastor of a small Latino church, and then I came over to admissions, and uh, I wrote a, a, a brief article about this idea of a communication flow at independent school, but I wrote that my admiration for admissions professionals admitted to a small size schools has grown exponentially since that time because of all the challenges we face. So um, the purpose, you know, every, every good teacher has an objective, right, at the, at the beginning of uh, any webinar. Uh, the objective is that you understand two things by the time we're done with this webinar. Number one is the rationale. Uh, why would we do this? Why would we build this uh, system uh, for a communication flow uh, for this type of strategic conversation? So what is the rationale for this? And then number two, uh, we're going to spend probably about 15, 20 minutes on this, hopefully to give you some tools to actually do it and actually write down uh, some things. So if you do have a piece of paper or an iPad, get that out right now. You may want to take some notes during the webinar, uh, but, but you, you hopefully will actually get something uh, tangible, I guess you could say, at the end of this webinar. So let me hop right into our presentation. First, I want to talk about Front Range Christian School. There we are. We own a shopping mall here in uh, Littleton, Colorado. You know, I started here in, in 2010, and when you start a, a position, at a school, you really want to figure out a little bit of the history. And uh, Front Range Christian School, when I started, had been through some very rocky, very rocky times. 2005, 2006, enrollment kind of hit a record high. It was about 560 to 70 at that time. But since then, for about four years, they had been, what I would say, is hemorrhaging. They had been losing students. I mean, we're talking percentage-wise, double-digit decline. 9%, uh, 10%, 11%, 12% for four years. Uh, the head of school had left in 2009. There was a, a big debate uh, between some parents and some teachers, and it split the school uh, in half. There was teacher, teacher turnover was over 50%. And in our facilities, too, there was deferred maintenance like crazy. I mean, holes in the ceiling and parking lot and stained carpet. So the budget was shrinking pretty bad. Our community reputation was still pretty good, some really quality people, some very good spots, but many people, especially in the churches in our area, which is a key constituency for us, they had known us for this dispute. They had been known for this dispute, and so we had some PR issues as well. So, of course, when I started in 2010, you get one task as an admissions professional, and what is that? Get more students without spending more money, head of school. That is what you need. Of course, our budget had been shrinking. We had been losing students, and so you cannot, um, you cannot spend any more money because we don't have any more money. We've been losing money. And so I brought this up to our head of school and said, look, how, can we, how are we going to move forward with admissions if we don't have any more money to spend? We have a few issues here. For instance, reputation. We have branding issues, teacher, teacher turnovers. Some of our systems in the school were kind of mom pa systems. And, uh, facilities challenges right there. Our academic product was fairly good, but not overly so. And I said, there's challenges here. We, we, we don't even have more money for getting more students. What are we going to do here? And he said, nonetheless, you need to go and get more students. Okay, so do more without spending more. Well, that's the challenge, I think, for a lot of admissions professionals, especially mid to small size private schools. You don't have a huge market. Or I'm sorry, you don't have a huge uh, budget. So the first thing I did, and this is going to lead into the rationale for a communication flow, is you've got to first figure out our, our market. So number one, our market is pretty darn narrow. So number one, uh, who are we looking for? What is families who share our beliefs? So with Front Range Christian Schools, uh, we, we're looking for families, obviously, in the, in the area that think Christianity uh, is a good idea. Um, and this, especially in this area of Colorado, it already shrinks our market by quite a bit in the United States in the past 20 years, the number of nuns or no religious affiliation. And Colorado as well as the United States has been shrinking. And so we have a smaller percentage of the general population that we're going after here. So that's one narrowing factor. The second 
uh, narrowing factor here is families who are relatively wealthy. Now, we're not a terribly expensive school. Our tuition ranges anywhere from 6000 to 9000 uh, per year. But nonetheless, we are still trying to recruit that top 10% of income uh, earners in our area. Uh, so they're going to need to spend, if you take a look at it, anywhere from anywhere from $400 more per month in their family budget to, if they have several kids, it could be $1,200, it could be $1,500 more per month. So this means that when we are looking at, at recruiting families, they're going to need a little bit of disposable income, but we're also trying to sell somebody on what I would call a luxury good of luxury goods. There's very few other uh, buys that a parent or a family would make that is more expensive this on a regular basis. Perhaps their mortgage is more expensive, but that would, I think, even be a lot of families would be less important because, at least for most families I know, your kids are more important than your house. And so what we're trying to get people to do is to have an entire uh, lifestyle change that's going to totally change their family budget. This especially for the middle income earners, but even for the wealthy, because you, you know that um, as soon as you get more money, you spend more money as well. So our market, number one, is, is narrowed a little bit by those who share belief. It's narrowed a little bit more because we're in that top 10% of earners. And Independence Collect did an article on this, on the 1% problem, right? But we're narrowing it down a little bit further. Um, but then there's a one more narrowing factor is families who already understand the value of, in our instance, Christian education, or more generally, independent education. So even if you are, for instance, a Christian in our area, uh, relatively wealthy. You need to see the value of what we are doing. And I'm going to take you just briefly into some of the issues with that. Um, historically in the United States, uh, evangelical Protestants are a little bit more focused on outreach and evangelism than two things that I think are very necessary for quality schools, which is the value of spiritual formation uh, as well as careful thought, good thinking. Uh, Catholics and the Reformed tradition, they have been a little bit better at this typically than evangelicals. And so what we always struggle with within our demographic is, well, are you guys being outwardly focused enough there? And so our institution is already seen a little bit as um, perhaps a little suspect, I guess you might say, is not being outwardly focused, right? Uh, but I'll, not only that, why, we all know this, there is a, a free alternative to an independent school right down the street is the public school, right? So what is the value of it? Why should I spend so, why should I make this major lifestyle change uh, it, it, to come to your school? You have to make the case for that, okay? Then the next part, which narrows it even more, then I'll understand it. If you get somebody that is wealthy, that shares our beliefs, that understand the value of independent education, but this last narrowing factor, number four, is what I would say is institutional alignment. So once you actually find this person, which is a needle in the haystack, you know, they actually have to like what our school is doing. Uh, academically, fine arts, sports, they have to live close enough to make it feasible to drive there every single day. Um, uh, then we actually have to accept them because there are several families that uh, we don't accept for one reason or another. The point of this is that when you take a look at our market, uh, it is incredibly narrow, the types of people that we are looking for. And it's also incredibly narrow, the type of people that are going to raise their hand and say, I am interested in what you're doing at your school. I, I want to talk to you about it. This leads me to this point, and I think all of us recognize this. Each inquiry is incredibly value, valuable. I mean, we take a look at some of the, um, um, of the numbers on this, marketing dollars versus how much, how many inquiries we get, it's in the hundreds oftentimes, hundreds of dollars that we have to pay to get a new inquiry. Sometimes a little less depending on what marketing tool we're using, but every single one, they've already gone through this vetting process that I just uh, described, and schools cannot afford to what we call in our admissions department is to underwork an inquiry. We need to sit down and get to know these people really, really well. So. This is some of the narrow market, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the typical solutions oftentimes fall short. Well, this is what I wrote about in an article. This is what typical solutions are. You find your niche in the market and you do a mass marketing campaign based around the principles of demand for schools. Um, and NIS did a nice little book on admissions marketing and there's um, um, an article in there that talks about the principles of demand for schools. One is demographics, two is high incomes, three is attitudes about education. 
uh, four is public competition, and five is your public options in the area. So these are the different things that you just you have to find your niche in the market. You do a mass marketing campaign. You focus on uh, those people, uh, and you try to bring them in. But there's a couple of different issues of this, especially when you take a look at the principles demand for public schools. Number one, in our area, the public in our the public schools in our area, actually they're pretty good. We are in the South Denver metropolitan area. We're right by the Littleton Public School District as well as Douglas County. Douglas County, if you watch the news, we were in the middle of this uh, a voucher debate. There was kind of a big push to get vouchers, which we were obviously a big fans of, but then they pushed against it and they were kind of canceled. Uh, regardless, Douglas County School District, that's right there to our south. These are some of the highest performing schools as well as charter schools in the United States, uh, typically more, more wealthy. And when we look at our market, if you don't see that the need for our particular uh, brand of education, especially if you don't see the value of Christianity within the educational process, the, uh, the, the value, the case statement becomes a little bit more difficult to make. So the number one problem is the public schools in our area, they're pretty good. And so we're going to have to do something to stick out to really make ourselves look different. Number two is oftentimes mass marketing is prohibitively expensive. Right. This is what I talked about. Our budget had been shrinking. We are a small school. We are uh, in a shopping mall. Mass marketing is extremely expensive. TV, newspaper, radio ads can be thousands of thousands per week. We actually have done some radio ads in the past, um, but but um, they're just really really expensive, and oftentimes they're not even very effective. For instance, direct mail. We've done several different direct mail campaigns, and if you're lucky, you get a one percent uh, return rate even to a very, send it to a very well-targeted list, 1%. We even tried once to send, a, do a mass, mar, mass mailing to a very, very good list in our area, and then we got their phone numbers as well and called them. And after uh, sending uh, all these postcards as well as uh, calling over 300 different families to see if they're interested in our school, uh, after weeks of work, we got one nanny who thought she knew somebody who might be interested in our school. Um, not exactly what we're looking for for mass marketing. But I think there's another problem which is more pervasive within our age for uh, the typical solutions for the mass marketing campaign. And that's, you know, we live in what I would call a culture of noise, a culture of marketing noise. I have a little image on the screen right there. Oh, it's, uh, it's from the Denver Post, but all sorts of web ads on there. There's advertising and there's noise absolutely everywhere. We look. It's in the newspapers. It's in the radio. It's getting for our attention, trying to get our attention at, at the mall. And you know, it's hard to say. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this at the end. But I think maybe five, six years ago, we hit kind of a breaking point where everything started to shift over to social media. And I think, well, there's several different cultural reasons, I guess, why this is happening. But one of the reasons is the noise. How can I trust you? How can I trust this ad? You're paying me to try to get my, uh, or you're paying to try to get my attention in this ad. Uh, in the age of social media, you know, if somebody I know doesn't recommend your school, then I am simply not interested. I, I'm sure you find this too at your school. But the two ways that people find out about our school is the internet, is Google, and it's what I would say trust. It's word of mouth. It's people chatting, right? Uh, all of the mass marketing and advertising, we've tried so many different things. Um, uh, some of it works to a degree, and you have to keep on doing those different things. But the point of this is that it is, it, it is a lot of noise. You need to start building trust. You have to start uh, really growing in people's hearts and minds. And you can do that through word of mouth, which is other good SSATB seminars uh, on this as far as getting more inquiries. But uh, the biggest question that I have for us today is when somebody does go through this extremely difficult vetting process that is either passive or active, and they said, yes, I'm interested in your school, what do you do? What's your plan? Here's the greatest challenge, in, in, my, in my opinion, with admissions. What do you do when a family has just finished their tour and left the school? What do you do? Everybody gives them a tour, a packet. And almost everybody leaves excited at that point, right? But you have to realize, in the coming weeks and months, there are all sorts of factors going into whether this is going to be worth it for the family. Is there not? They're always trying to make this 
this calculation in their mind, is it really worth it, the outcome over the actual price tag of your school? We're asking them to make a major lifestyle change. And so in the coming months, they're going to be asking questions such as social environment, is the academic product worth it, is the quality of teachers, uh, did they share our values, the financial value, what about the sports and the fine arts, are we going to be known in this community? There's all these other different factors that are going on right here, but the vast majority of schools They'll, get, they'll do a couple of different things. They'll say they'll give them an application packet and maybe do a phone call or to follow up. But um, every school does that. Every school gives an application packet and does a phone call or to follow up. So how is that different uh, from what you are doing from all your different competitors? And even if this, the family has made the decision right there, they are sold. My guess is that you found this as well. There's generally a pretty big gap between excitement and actually paying for it or actually going through the application process because so many different things can happen in the process. Maybe a bad shadow day, uh, maybe um, uh, something happens with friends at their current school and, they, and their ninth grader cannot leave. There's all sorts of different things. Uh, yeah, admissions oftentimes falls clean off the map for this family, either from the time they inquire or from the time that they tour. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? Is it just a couple of phone calls? Um, they are going to be weighing your school against three or four others and then in the following months after you've had your best chance to try to sell your school. What are you doing uh, that is going to really help to convert uh, this person that's toured into a new family at your school? There's a good metaphor that a guy named Seth Godin, he's the author of a book called Permission Marketing. Uh, has said, he says, he says this, most marketers are like a bachelor who buys a new suit, finds the best singles bar in the city, meets a girl and proposes marriage after the first date. Now, if you met this bachelor, well, you, this guy's pretty good looking, but if you met this guy and he proposed even after the first date, as attractive as he may be, you might think a little bit strange. But you also might think that would be a little strange if you were going to give a tour to a family and you tell them, apply right now, apply right now, apply right now, which by the way, I've been in an inquiry at dozens of different uh, colleges throughout the United States just to find out what they do. Most of their communication flow is only apply right now, apply right now, apply right now, marry me, marry me, marry me. But I don't even know you, <laughs> right? Why should I marry you? This is what most independent schools do and actually most colleges in the United States as well. They say, look at this beautiful view book. Look at my website. Look at the pretty football field. Let's get married. Remember, we're asking people for a lifestyle change, a thousand bucks a month, 500 bucks a month. This is a, a major change of what it's going to look like for their family, both financially as even where they're going to live. And we've had people move up from across the city to be closer to our school. Is it really going to work to propose marriage after a single date? We oftentimes realize that with, with inquiries. People have already been thinking about it for a long time. And then even after they leave for a tour, they still have more thinking processing to it. It's not going to work to propose after the first date. There is a better solution. Seth Godin talks about this. By the way, if, if, if you're looking at growing in your uh, marketing abilities, Seth Godin, you should follow his blog. He's probably one of the biggest um, business bloggers on the net. I'm going to read you a quote from him in a second here. But uh, he's got some good thoughts. He's definitely got some really, really good thoughts. And he writes, he published three books at the end of this last year. But um, he's kind of a leader with uh, marketing in the 21st century. Anyway, he says that permission marketing is a much better approach. So, for instance, in this, if we're following the dating uh, metaphor, what you want to do when you're dating somebody is you first go on one date, and then you let a few days go by maybe, and then you go on another date, and then after about 12, 13, 14 dates, perhaps you'll meet the family, and then after you talk for a while and you determine that it's a good fit for the both of you, then then you might propose marriage because you're realizing this is no small decision. How many, different how many different touches, how many different interactions, how many different conversations have happened up to this point into this marriage? Well, a whole bunch. It's not just one, oh, I'm going to put on my best so suit and, and, and um, propose marriage to you. You need to develop a conversation as you would uh, in any, any relationship, in any dating relationship. And, you know this as well. Independent schools, this is a luxury good. We are not selling hairspray. Okay, This is the future of their children, and this is a very, very expensive uh, undertaking for them. So you're going to have to develop a, a quiet, patient conversation. 
this is a good principle. You can't turn strangers into customers. This is what Seth talks about a lot. He says you first have to turn strangers into friends and then friends into customers. Right? This is what you want to be doing, turning strangers into friends and then friends into customers. I don't have time, you might say this, I don't have time to make friends with hundreds of inquiries. Like tr we know this trust is built so through frequency just like a dating relationship. If you don't call somebody for three months, you're done. It's not going to work. So you need to build trust through frequency, but you might say, gosh, I don't have time to uh, baby people through this process. What you need to do then is then offer them uh, a curriculum over time. Date your customer. Like a teacher, offer a curriculum which is information about your school, to your student, which is the prospective family, over time. Okay? So like a teacher, if you think a look at think about a syllabus, you're going to take a look at what we're going to do for the next three months or so. Uh, and slowly, I'm going to be building and developing a relationship uh, with them over time. And you're going to teach them. You're going to tutor them everything from about your academic programs and your teachers and your community life and your fine arts and sports and all that all that stuff. You want to uh, hold their hand through the process. You want to teach them like a student or like a dating relationship. You need to walk them through really the value of your school over time. This is what you really want to do. The goal is to offer numerous personal, relevant, anticipated messages to your customer. Let's go over that. Those are all three of those I think are incredibly important. They're part of the rationale for a comp flow. Number one is personal, not mass marketing, not mass media. If you are mass media, you will get tuned out. This is a rule. This is a, this is a rule. I see it all over, the, all over the place. You need personal communications. That means it must come from a person. Okay? Personal is very, very important. Number two is relevant. That is, don't try to sell them something they're not interested to. You're going to have to fine tune it for what they are actually needing and interested in. Amazon is, by the way, the king of this. When you click on something and you buy a book, Two weeks later, you're going to get an email with three or four other books in that category. Uh, Seth, by the way, Seth Godin, who I'm getting this from, he helped Amazon get this off the ground uh, at the beginning of when they were getting big. And they do that. You're only going to sell what you are interested in, right? So when we're thinking about our comp flow, our communication flow, they need to be personal to you from a person. They need to be relevant to your actual needs and interests and not kind of a blanket campaign. And number three is anticipated. There's nothing worse than a mass marketer calling you at dinner uh, and you're trying to hang out with your family, have a dinner with your family, and they're trying to sell you on tickets to the Nuggets game, uh, the Denver Nuggets, right? Those people take me off, they probably tick you off as well. However, if the information is anticipated, for instance, if you go to Qdoba and you sign up for their email marketing list, you want to get some coupons, as my family oftentimes does, um, that is an anticipated email. I keep getting those emails because I like what they're giving to me. Now, if Qdoba slams me with a bunch of stuff I'm not interested in, or another company, for instance, Talbots, which I live in a little, I live uh, in a neighborhood next to a mall, and there's a there's a shop, a women's clothing store called Talbots. If they just start hitting me with um, ads, you know, I, I don't. I'm not a, a middle-aged woman. This is I'm not interested in this. This is not relevant nor is anticipated or welcome. So this is what you need. You need to build these types of communications, personal, relevant, and anticipated. So moral of the story is this. Marketing is a conversation. It's not a, bam, we're going to get you after this one great tour, this one fantastic view book. You must develop a conversation with people that are interested. Seth's blog, uh, by the way, um, uh, he, he just posted this a couple days ago. A post, and I think I have a little bit of time to go over it, but it's really good illustration of why this is so important. This is what he said. He said, the other day I heard the CEO of a large corporation join on for 20 minutes. He was pitching a large group of strangers, reading them a long prepared speech that was largely irrelevant to their needs. They weren't there to hear him, and in fact, weren't even able to hear him over the buzz in their heads. This was classic interruption. No permission granted. You need permission. If you'd interviewed the 150 people in a room an hour later, no one could have told you a single thing about what he said. If your tactic is to have a one shot, the equivalent of a pickup line in a singles bar is pretty hopeless. You can't sell anything complex or risky in this way. Everybody, independent schools, private schools, Christian schools, this is complex, this is risky, this is expensive. You can't sell things that way. On the other hand, Seth says, what if you'd taken three minutes just to read and say, oh, let's talk. 
Give out his personal contact info in an easy way and a good reason to engage with the staff, and then give the podium and let the event go forward. Don't sell us anything but what do you really want, the burning desire to follow up. This is a very important part of permission marketing. The only thing that you want to do is when you do all of your marketing is you need to get their information uh, so that you get the permission to follow up, and you need their permission. Do not spam people. So this is, this is the point of the talk. It wasn't to get a new customer, nor was it to get through the talk and get over with it, which is both silly and selfish. No, the point of the talk should have been to open the door and to have a better individual conversation soon. This is what Seth says, and he says at the end of this blog post, drip, drip, drip. And we're going to talk about a drip marketing campaign here in a second. Um, personal, relevant, anticipated messages. But there is um, a problem with that, too. We're going to have to build a bunch of communications, even after the contest, and they seem like they're going to sign up right away, or perhaps they haven't been in for a tour yet and they just inquired. We're going to need to build a system uh, that works on its own, and you're going to have to bring some order from chaos. Um, for instance, in the, book of, in the book of Genesis, God takes the primordial ooze and takes uh, uh, what was formless and void, and he builds uh, order from it and separates the light from the dark, and he, um, uh, in six days' time, builds an entire system that is useful for human flourishing in the world. We, too, need to build a, a system that is useful for this family and that can help answer their questions and really serve their needs, serve their needs well. So marketing is a conversation. What you need to do is build a system of communications that answer some of these questions, that stay in front of them over the time, that shows that you care about them, and we'll do it from all sorts of different angles. And so this is what we want to do is we want to build what we call a communication flow. A communication flow is simply this a system for delivering key, personal, anticipated, relevant messages over time. The goal is more students, is more conversions, obviously, but it's not in a way that tries to do the hard sell. Uh, this is something I'm working with somebody for some advertising right now at our school, and she just always says, hurry now, rush now, or, or we're not going to have any more movie theater ads available. Please. <laughs> Please, that's such a line. I know that if I call you in a month, you're going to have plenty of ads available. Just like if you say to a family, apply now, apply now, apply now, uh, they're going to have more room. I mean, families are smart, right? What we want to do is just walk alongside of them. We want to answer their questions. We want to show love to them. We want to design a conversation that helps to increase enrollment at our school, yes, but really meets their needs. So this is what we're going to do. Get out your piece of paper and a pen or an iPad. And if you're interested in actually doing this, building your communication flow, that's what we're going to do for the next oh, 15 minutes or so. Okay? So this is how you do it. Number one. Make a list of the distinct advantages of your school. So you can call this what you want, the strategic positioning, or your niche in the market, or what you're really good at, or you're better than others in your geographical area. But you need to sit down. This could be with your executive team. Um, this might be with a group of parents. If you haven't done this, you may just grab this from the strategic plan that your school has. But you need to sit down and say, these are the three things that really make Front Range Christian School, or whatever your school is, different from those in our area. Our school, for instance, really focuses on discipleship, the spiritual formation of students. We really focus on community service, which is uh, a strong one, something that our students have been very service focused uh, throughout the world. Um, and a great college preparatory uh, curriculum in grades 9 through 12. But you need to personally write down, and I encourage you to do that right now, just think about it. What are uh, the top three or four strategic advantages that really separate you from other schools? Now, please do not say broad, general stuff like academic excellence. Um, everybody says that. This does not make you different from anybody else. In the Christian school world, uh, which you'll see if you go on the Front Range Christian School website, we say distinctively Christian. Uh, I tried to push against that because, frankly, all schools say versions of we're really Christian or, 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 or maybe an equivalent another school is character development. Okay, hammer down. Really, how do you develop character in your students? What is it that you really do that other schools in your area don't, don't do? You might need to, again, ask around, but this is really important because this is how you're going to build your Comflow based on, on these things. So um, do this right now if you have a chance. Uh, write down your top three or four things that you think are the most important differences, distinct advantages of your school over another school. I'm going to give you about 
just a few seconds and then we'll go right on to the next thing. So after you have that, number two, what you want to do is you want to plan out your conversation. Okay? So if you were uh, going to have an ideal conversation uh, with this family, what would it look like? Well, you talk about those three things, obviously, that are, are, are uh, uh, best about your school, a distinct advantage. But you also might want to talk about financial aid. You also might want to talk about an open house that's coming up. You might want to communicate how much your teachers care. Um, Perhaps your music department is fantastic, or maybe your community life is amazing. Your parents are huge fans. You don't have to talk about how yet, but I want you to talk about what is the actual messaging that you want to get through. What are these things? And so write down right now what are the types of things that you either do communicate right now to inquiries or that you want to communicate that really says this is important, this is how we're going to keep on building our case, and, and just develop this curriculum as a teacher would walk his or her student through a curriculum. What does your curriculum look like? Um, down the road, you will want some sort of communication that does say apply now, uh, either through a phone call or email, whatever that might be. But down the road, you don't propose marriage after the first date. Yeah, you want to do this after you've been dating for a little while, and then you move them to a level of commitment. Okay? So you're writing down now a list of probably some broad things that you want to communicate of these strategic advantages and these other types of things that you want to communicate to families. And then number two, what you want to do out here is you want to pick a time frame. So um, this is different for every school. Uh, it could be two to four months, three to five months, but you're going to actually have to dug or you have to pick an actual time frame of how long you want this drip marketing campaign to last. Um, our school is about 120 days, uh, but this, there's no real right answer on this, but uh, how long do you want this drip marketing campaign to last? You do want to move them to the point of decision, um, and um, uh, you want to do it by the time your application deadline obviously comes, but pick a timeline. This is going to be very important. And then this is going to help just with the logistics of the, your comm flow, is you're going to want to pick the number of touches. Okay, So you can pick anywhere from nine to 20 uh, in three to five months. Uh, we've done anywhere from only 10 to almost 20, depending on different uh, demographics. I'll talk about this later. But just write down a number. Uh, if you don't have any idea right now, I'd say just pick 12 or 13 right now. Okay? Some are going to do more, some are going to do less. So what you have now developing is this. You have your strategic advantages, right? Uh, number two, you have your conversation, the types of things you want to say. You want to do it over about three, maybe to five months, you want to say maybe 10, 12 really unique things that are going to be your curriculum or your conversation as you're dating your customer. Okay? Hopefully you guys are sticking up with me. Um, let's go to the next part of it here because the webinar, unfortunately, is not terribly long, uh, but we'll try to get through everything here. Number three is this, mix your mediums of delivery. You know, you don't want to send people all emails. You don't want to send all letters. Sometimes if you do all emails, you're just spamming them. If it's all letters, people don't even read the mail. Um, you don't want to do all phone calls or it's just that those people that just keep calling you. Why do they keep calling me? Stop calling me. I'll let you know whenever I want to. You want these to be touches in different ways. But, you know, honestly, if people are aware that they're being sold, <laughs> and usually that happens through a single medium, then you kind of lose the battle. You want a friendly conversation, friendly conversation. So I suggest that you um, do some sort of a mix of emails, videos, personal letters, um, maybe even a postcards, as well as certainly phone calls in this complo, in this system of communications. Could be 10, 12, 14 communications. And um, I wrote on here, be logical about which mediums communicate the best messages, right? So, for instance, financial aid information, I think this is pretty logical for a good email. This is information. It's not terribly personable. But when you do want to share a story, you know, videos, I think, are hugely important. Which you go, if you go on our website, frcs.org, and you click on the top mega menus, we've spent a little bit of time doing some pretty good videos. You do want to tell the story of why this has made a difference in people's lives. Uh, and why the teachers are great and whatever. You want to tell the story. So, for instance, say you have one communication uh, about uh, the community. You should send them a video of somebody saying that, right? Maybe a student, maybe an alum, maybe a parent, 
but that's a good medium for that, right? Um, down the road, a phone call would be a good medium for admissions because as you try to move somebody to commitment, it's best to do it over the phone and drive them to, uh, to marriage. Ultimately, it is what you want. But be logical about this. And if you're getting a little mixed up here, I'm going to have a little graph for you in a second that's going to outline it. So don't worry too much, okay? But you want to mix your mediums of delivery. You want to be pretty logical with what you want to say and how you say it, okay? So try to match the message with the medium at this step, okay? So various different mediums of delivery. Number four, you want to produce the content, okay? So if you, for instance, think you want to send a letter from a teacher to a prospective student, well, one of the things that we did, and this took a little bit of work, I had every single teacher at Front Range Christian School write a letter to a prospective student. Now, we obviously know what students are going into, I'm sorry, what grades that the students are going into. And at the junior, senior high, every single prospective student will get a personal signed letter from a teacher. That's one element of many communications from, from the teacher to the student. At the elementary side, the, the teachers are writing to the, um, the actual parents. But this took a little bit of time. You want to involve your community in producing this content. For instance, a, a personal letter from a teacher or perhaps a, an email from an administrator about the spiritual life at your school, or a phone call text from admissions about financial aid, or you need to talk with your comm department about uh, uh, designing a postcard invite to an upcoming open house. Now, these are time sensitive, and so for this, by the way, if you have several open houses on the year, just as a suggestion, I'd write, I would suggest that you write down every single open house that you do that year. That way your postcard will stay good through your very last open house event for the year, okay? Um, uh, other things could be like a parent's personal testimony video. You're going to have to find somebody actually to make the video. Uh, and these can be done pretty cheap. If you'll see on the Front Range Christian School website, I personally did some videos, and I have no experience. But I did some videos with teachers, and they were, they were helpful uh, until we were at the place where we could spend a little bit of money and get some more professional videos. They were... They were helpful. So these don't, again, we, we're doing this on an extreme budget. We don't have a lot of money, but you can do these with just a video camera and a microphone and asking people some questions. Videos are a great way to share, um, to share your story. So think about this, and I want you to think about this from the parent's perspective right now, okay? You leave the school, you're so impressed, you get jazzed up, but then you're not quite sure. Maybe this school, maybe it's too costly, maybe it drives too far. But then in the coming weeks, you get an email from an administrator that says, oh, I heard that you're coming, or that you're interested in Frontage Christian School. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, you get a personal letter from a teacher. You get an email uh, about financial aid. You get another email about a video of an alum. Uh, and then perhaps a personal note to the 10th grade student from the admissions department, and so on and so forth for several months, where all, whereby all your other competitors they're resting on their laurels, perhaps, and they're going to be thinking, oh, they're going to be impressed with their football field or whatever it might be. By the way, our facilities are not impressive <laughs> in any way. So we've had to design systems that are impressive. Um, but when your competitors are just thinking, you know, oh, the packet will be just fine, you will be in contact, in touch with them. And not just you, but all these different people from your community are going to be in touch with you. Um, as a Christian myself, uh, one of the key things for me uh, is Jesus' commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And number two is to love your neighbor as yourself. When you think about people that are coming through your doors, they oftentimes come with fear and trembling. Something's not going right at their school right now. Um, they have some sort of need. And to love people, uh, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis, is to care for their good, is to uh, work for their good. And this is going to help people a lot more than just kind of a thumbs up, I hope you find the right school that fits you. This is uh, ultimately in service of uh, families, and it's going to help to answer a lot of their questions, and it's going to keep them in touch over time, okay? The, th the next step here is automate your comp flow, automate your communication floor. This really is key. We're going to talk about technology here in a second, uh, but we use a thing called a drip marketing campaign. Now, I want to show you a little graph of what I have personally done in admissions, and this is kind of what it looks like for your comp flow. So take a look at the left side of your screen. What 
Okay, but first think about what do you want to communicate? We're going back to those key things, your strategic advantages. That's why I wrote science on there. Maybe your science department is unbelievable. Or maybe you're in the Rocky Mountains and you're a boarding school in the Rocky Mountains and you're in Steamboat Springs. Uh, Location is going to be a big deal, right? So you're going to talk about the what you want to on the left side. And then you're going to talk about from whom. Who do you want this communication coming from? Ultimately, your department of admissions will help to facilitate it all. But who do you want this coming from? So teacher. Well, what do you want coming from the teacher? Maybe a personal letter. And when do you want it to happen? Well, on day seven, after you initiate the drip campaign. We're going to talk about that in a second, right? So after they leave your campus, they're going to get uh, they're going to get a letter on day seven. The next thing maybe is a strategic thing is a location. Uh, it's great. A parent had on a video says this is the most beautiful place in the world. Why wouldn't I send my kid to your sporting school, right? And then they're going to get that on day fourteen. They're going to get that through email. And then maybe the next time is financial aid information because we know that's a big barrier. They're going to get a phone call from admissions just saying, oh, no, we know that affording a private school can be difficult. This is all that we offer financial aid. We would love to have your family here. That's day 21. Um, and then maybe the community, maybe a parent sends a personal email. And we have a system by which we could do this too on day 28 that, oh, the community is here. We'd love to have you involved in our community here as well. Now this is not law, how I have, I have 10 different communications here. You can do what you want with this system here, uh, depending on what you want to communicate, from whom, the types of mediums that you can deliver, and then when. I can just have to do every week, it could be uh, three days. Uh, I, I actually suggest that in the first month you have more communications and more tightly bound, uh, because that's when there's going to be most excitement. And then uh, in the second month, you could taper the back a little bit, maybe every seven to eight, so seven to ten days. But again, I don't have the right like the right answer for this. This is just um, uh, this is a drip marketing campaign. Okay, this is what this uh, talks about. So this is your sequence of communications. This is your calm flow, and this is really key. All right. Um, so automate it. What will you need? You'll need a CRM system, email marketing program. You know, after I wrote this article for Independent School, I got all sorts of people calling me about it and emailing. Uh, and I think this is the kicker that prevents a lot of people from actually doing a comm flow, though it will help. It will help you. Um, one of them is how they're organizing their um, inquiries right now, customer relations management system. Um, and then the second is the email marketing program. So. We were using one called through RenWeb. Uh, I really don't suggest <laughs> RenWeb <laughs> for anything like this. They don't know the sales process or pipeline. They, they just haven't built the systems for it. But things, for instance, uh, the one that we use is called Act uh, Sage. It's a type of um, basically just sales software. Another one is called Salesforce. But organizing uh, all of your inquiries in this. And so it was a little bit of work. We had to one year start over and use a CRM system that was helpful, and, and the key thing was one that could talk to an email marketing system. So in our particular comm flow, and again, this is not, you don't have to do it this, but we, this is cheap and we made this work. We use ACT and we use an email marketing program called Swift Page, which I'm going to show you in a second. So the nice thing with this, you actually host your drip marketing campaign in Swift Page, you build it in there, but your inquiries are all in ACT. And so because ACT talks well with Swift Page, what you can basically do is just click a button on ACT, initiate a drip campaign, and the system of communications will have been um, uh, initiated within, your, um, within, the, within the communication flow. So Salesforce, I'm told, can do something like this. Blackbaud, I think, does something like this as well. I say I think because they're way out of our price range, um, but I'm, um, I hear they do some great stuff. But we rig the system for a medium, again, to private size uh, school, okay? So um, I'm more than willing to take questions on this momentarily. How am I doing on time, everybody? Uh, I need a couple more minutes, and we're going to get to questions, and then we'll, we'll be done. So uh, this is the system. You need to do a communication flow. You need a CRM system. We use it in ACT, and then we use a thing called Swift Page. Um, and this is what it looks like within Swift Page. So you build it in there, and there's different things you can do in there. And you take a look at number one. This is a day eight personal email from a teacher. Well, you have a little phone icon there. Well, basically, an automatic email from Swift Page will come to our admissions department saying, personal email from teacher, and we'll send a little note to a teacher saying, would you be willing to send an email to, to you know, Johnny Johnson's family and talk about your classroom? And then on day 15, they're going to get a letter in the mail from a head of school about uh, how the importance of a Christian worldview. On day 23, it will be um, 
a personal note from maybe the admissions department. And then uh, on day 30 will be an email about the Front Range Christian School community, a parent testimony. And then another 12 days later, there'll be another email about our professional teachers and how many masters and PhDs and how much they love their students. And then down the road, there'll be a letter from a teacher that goes from there. So as again, you can see, this is a drip marketing system that's initiated. Some of them, the emails happen, happen automatically. The letters and the notes are given reminders to the admissions department to do things, as well as the emails from a teacher, from outside people. Those come to us, and then we go in and manually say to this or that teacher, would you be willing to send a quick note? So you had to get teachers on board a little bit with this, but you know, I think some of the, the best private schools in the country, they're already aware that um, Teachers, everybody has to be involved with marketing a school. And you know, I've found from our teachers, if it's very finite, uh, just send a couple emails uh, a few times a month. It's it's not too difficult of an ask. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll take questions about this in a second. So, what are the benefits of doing this? Long-term conversation. You are developing this conversation. You're dating them, and you're not just trying to get them to to, to marry on the first date. You build trust through frequency. So, the great problem with advertising. Uh, yeah, if you're Apple, you know, and you can spend billions of dollars on advertising, you can build a lot of trust in your products. But from a Christian school, I'm sorry, it's not Apple. We build trust this way. As somebody touches us and they say, I'm interested, we build trust through these drip communications that leads into commitment down the road. And I think one of the best parts of uh, building a complo is, is peace. Uh, I think there's, for admissions professionals, there's that annoying thing in the back of our mind um, that says, did I do everything I could with that family? Did I, was I convincing enough? Was I, um, did I call them enough times? Did we really do everything we could to bring them home? And our head of schools, you know, they're going to be asking that exact same thing, right? Well, you can tell them exactly what the types of follow-up communication they've gotten. And by the way, we just schedule within our, our pipeline, we schedule two or three follow-up phone calls right away in the first couple of weeks, which is not a part of our comp flow, and that's what all of our competitors do as well. So we do that as well, uh, but this is what really separates us from a lot of our competitors. Now, honestly, this takes uh, about a month to do well. Um, it takes a couple of weeks of good thinking of what you want to communicate and decide in the mediums, and then it takes several weeks of, uh, of getting teachers and people in your community to help produce the, the content uh, for this, whether it be a video or a letter from a teacher. Uh, so I would suggest not doing it this time of year, but maybe June or July when it's a little bit quieter and you can work on uh, doing some of these different things. Uh, getting a hold of teachers in that time, as you know, is a little bit challenging, but it's uh, certainly possible. But I, I would encourage you to actually do this um, and to, to make this system work for your school. Let me tell a couple of final stories. Uh, one of my mentors, he is the VP of uh, Student Life and Enrollment Management over at Denver Seminary. His name is Robert Jones. He's fantastic because I was getting into admissions a couple years ago. I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. And he proceeded to explain to me the idea of a comm flow, the idea of a communication flow. And he explained basically what I'm explaining to you right now. And his words held a little bit of weight for me. In the past six years, Denver Seminary had doubled in size. We are now the largest single site, I say we because I'm a Denver STEM graduate, single site, uh, largest single site seminary in North America. And so as he got done explaining this to me, he said, you know, Jeff, the comm flow will take you a long way. Do something like this. He kind of winked at me. So I tried to figure out how to do it considering the constraints I had of a very small budget. Um, and then this is only three weeks ago, a parent that uh, we initiated her drip campaign before she had even toured because we didn't know if she for sure was going to come in or tour or not. She said, uh, when she did come in for a tour, she said, you know, I knew your school was going to be great. The types of professional communication that came from your school, yeah, I knew this was the place for my kids. Um, I can't remember the parent's name right now, blonde hair, she had a couple of elementary kids. Those are the types of communications that we want. It doesn't seem like we're selling them. We just care. We're communicating. We do it in a professional way, and you do it in a systematic way as well. So that's the idea of a conflow. I would encourage you to... Uh, to do it uh, and to make it work for your context. And I'd be more than willing to answer any questions about how a communication flow works or even why we should do it in our contexts. Thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, uh, at this point, if you would like to type your questions into the um, text box on your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, I will read them to uh, Jeff as they come in, and he will answer them, and uh, we'll kind of move forward that way. Uh, Jeff, the first question is from Jason McGee. He's asking, 
is your communication flow example of what you would do for each family, since each family's needs can be different. And then he's asking, who writes the plan? That's a good question. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Uh, that's a good question. I would say communication flow 2.0 is making a difference. So each needs are different. And so now we'd only, I would say the best place to start is by building one communication flow with 12 different communications. But Front Range Christian School now is 10. <laughs> so going into elementary school that is interested in fine arts music, going into the high school that's interested in our sports program. So we built several different ones. And some of them are the same content, for instance, like financial aid um, is going to be similar or a phone call from us. But then some of them are unique, like an email, a personal email from the athletic director about uh, character and athletics, for instance. So um, we have built several of them down the road. But again, don't try this till your second year or you're just going to get overwhelmed with the complexity of it. But um, you want to just do one for now. But down the road, yes, uh, each family's needs are different. We have. I mean, a really high-performing student uh, who loves learning is going to have a very different set of needs than uh, kids with IEPs. Or we have a program here called the uh, the Learning Center, which is for kids with special needs, and they have a fully individualized curriculum. There's their needs are totally different, so we had to build a different console for them. So that was the the first part of your question. Um, I'm sorry, I got myself one more time. The second part of that question, I don't want to. Oh, uh, that was who creates it? Who who builds the plan? I do, yeah, the director of admissions. So I work with my comm director to actually get it taken care of, our communications director here. Obviously, she, she like, designed the emails. But uh, whoever is in charge of enrollment, that's you. You build the plan, and then you take the initiative and uh, uh, make sure it all gets done. OK, Rebecca Robinson is asking, using the communications flow, what is your standard conversion rate for tours to enrolled students and families compared to before? That's a good question. Uh, we don't have metrics for that yet. Um, I can't. Yeah, I can't tell you uh, what that what that is right now. They have they have significant got, gotten significantly better, but I don't have that right in front of me right now. Okay. Emily's asking. <laughs> they have RenWeb. Can they make it work? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you're using RenWeb to manage your inquiries. The issue is your the email marketing software doesn't doesn't talk with them, uh, and so what you have to do then is you have to put your inquiries into Red Web, but you also have to then put them into whatever email marketing software that you have as well. And then as soon as you start doubling places where you're managing relationships uh, with people, you know that's a headache. Uh, it's it's a big headache. Uh, you could uh, do that if you wanted to just use like for instance Swift Page or Salesforce. But I wouldn't recommend it if you could switch off of that to something that does have a sales funnel basically built into it for people that are in sales. I think it would be better. Hey, Jackie Jefferson is asking um, where social media fits into the communications flow. Is it, is it effective uh, as an addition to the communications flow? Absolutely. Those are aspects of the communication flow. Uh, so for instance, videos, we find those are extremely uh, helpful. Uh, links to our, our Facebook page, if they get two, for instance, links at the bottom of an email in a period of two months, those are helpful as well, but you don't want to inundate them. Honestly, most of our social media stuff is on the uh, something that I didn't even talk about at all, which is on the inquiry generation side of trying to get more inquiries, which is what this webinar was not really about. Uh, this was more about converting uh, more inquiries and uh, building a, a good system of communication. So for everything from our, our social media, our blogs, we've really focused on uh, getting some more blogs, going with teachers and ourselves and all sorts of that, stuff like that and sharing it through our social media. That's more on the inquiry generation. Then once they raise their hand, we put them into a, a Comflow uh, as well. That's that next level. When they raise their hand, that's the next level, I feel like, of intimacy that they're inviting you into. So call them and have a parent call them. and and just get to know them a little bit more. So we do that more of that on the on the front end, though we do have a couple of elements within the Comflow for social media. Okay. Jackie's also asking, how do you track where each family is in the communications flow when you have new families coming in every day? Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand that question. Um, how it works, it, it, you don't start, for instance, you don't you start them all after they finish the tour. 
So that's the nice thing is that everybody's going to be at a different place depending on when you initiated them. And so the communication coming from my office will be this nice, beautifully spaced communications that are as much as possible, again, uh, relevant, anticipated, and personal messages for them. But for instance, somebody comes in and finishes their tour on April 1st, uh, they're going to get launched in one Comflow, and then April 15th, they'll get launched in one as well. So they'll be starting day one uh, on April 15th. Another group will be starting day one, another person will start in on April 1st. So you can find out through SwiftPage, you can find out uh, where they're at, all the different communications that they've received from the different Comflow. It's kind of got a nice feature on there. You can even find out uh, who opened your email, who's clicking on things, who isn't. There's all sorts of these fun things that you can tell um, through through our email software. Email software. So I imagine your CRM sort of keeps track of that for you. Well, that's right. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a tab within our CRM system, and you can see all the communications they've gotten. The formal communications, which is obviously our tours and calls and notes and all that good stuff, and then the Comflow communications are in there as well. So we can find out where they're at. Great. Um, Andrea Hughes is asking, is there not a confidentiality issue in sharing a prospective family's email or physical address, student name, et cetera, with other parents or even non-admission staff members? Well, you know, that's a good question. I hope I don't get arrested. Um, we don't do that. <laughs> we don't. Well, we haven't had any problems with that. We've been doing this for a couple of years. Um, we only do this for those that request more information from the school. So there's a little thing, which I'm sure your school website has that as well. And so we take that to mean you want more information from our school about our community, and that isn't just a, a packet. So that's a good question. There, there may be, but we don't ever make the information public. We have a set of a handful of parents, and we have a couple of different teachers that then communicate with them as well. And I'm familiar with several universities that do something similar to this. And a teacher, for instance, or a college professor will send a quick note. Um, they're usually flattered, and they're not offended. Usually, for instance, though, like like one of our Comflows has a uh, um, a personal call from parent. Okay, well that's that's pretty intimate. I do not put people that have only inquired but have not toured, I do not put them in that one because that seemed a little weird to me if, if you got a phone call from somebody at a school that you only just inquired about but you haven't toured. However, somebody has been toured, they have met a bunch of people, they may have actually met that teacher and then to receive an email from that teacher two weeks later, um, it, hasn't, well, it hasn't been a problem. We've only got positive feedback on that. So we don't make their information public but we do share it with some key constituencies within our community. Okay. We have another question. Um, do you have a separate mini communications flow for the inquiry to tour process? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, no. No. Maybe we should. <laughs> we haven't got there yet. Our inquiry to tour is um, call them up about four or five times or email them uh, in a period of about two weeks. What we do right now is they pop out of, if, if we don't hear from them, if they contact us, okay, and they don't want to come in for a tour after us trying for several times, we'll initiate them in, into a conflict called No Tour. Uh, and that is several levels of communication as well, but it's not as many like personal ones like a call from a parent or whatever, but it is some more general stuff about our school, and then we let that take effect. So ultimately, if they get several calls, if they contact us, they get several calls, and then emails and videos and postcards and all these other things, they decide, that they don't want to, then, I mean, we don't we don't convert every inquiry <laughs> by any means. Um, but um, uh, we just do that. We just kind of have a system whereby the assumption is in our department highest priority is to to build a relationship with them and to have them come in meet us personally. Nothing nothing has changed here. Okay, thank you. Um, we're at the end of our questions, and yes. uh, what's really nice is that we're at the end of the webinar time, so that that works out very well. Uh, I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and a special thank you to Jeff for providing our attendees with such a helpful presentation. And just a reminder, I will send all registrants a link to the online webinar page, where a recording and a PDF of this presentation will be made available. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.